Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autobiology, the podcast with me, your host, Jennifer Little Fleck. And today I have on two very special guests, the first of which is my son, Weston Fleck. Weston, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I am Weston Fleck. I'm 12 years old, and I am in seventh grade at Ave Maria Academy in Pittsburgh. So this year for my science fair project, I am studying EMF and its effects on the human body and kind of how we can block ourselves from it, how we can shield it to prevent like illnesses and diseases and all those kind of stuff. Great. Thank you so much, Weston. Uh, Yes. So Weston's science fair project is the kind of the impetus for my interview with Daniel Debon. Now, if you're not um, aware of who he is, he is the author of Radiation Nation. He's an internationally recognized EMF expert in radiation, EMF shielding, and EMF health related issues with a very special focus on the effect of exposure from mobile devices, such as laptops, tablets, cell phones, all those things that we use every day. Now, Daniel's concern regarding the health impact of EMF emissions grew from over 30 years of engineering experience in the telecommunications industry, where he held a variety of executive positions at SAIC, Telcordia, AT&T, and Bell Labs. And as I mentioned, he is the co-author of Radiation Nation, the fallout of modern technology, and also the CEO of Defender Shield, the world leader in EMF radiation and protection solutions. Without any further ado, let's get this interview started. All right, I have this recording. Um, Daniel, it's uh, so great to have you on. You know, Weston is very excited, of course, obviously, you know that he is doing his project on EMFs, and um, it was very serendipitous that I ran into your team at Dave Asprey's biohacking conference. Right. And, uh, you know, got, um, you know, an opportunity not only to, you know, talk with him about your technology, but, you know, know, read your book as well. So, um, so so thank you so much for coming on. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me, Jennifer. I, I, I sort of, I, I really do talk about this subject to adults. Okay. And I really want the kids to understand it because like as an adult, you know, I, I haven't been exposed for that many years. For Weston's uh, life, it's his whole life. So it's really any toxin that's in our environment you need to be familiar with. And this is just one of them. So right. uh, we, we'd love to chat about it with kids. Parents need to know what's going on. Kids need to know. You just mentioned that, you know, it's really important for kids to understand the ramifications of EMF. And I couldn't agree more, you know, to be honest with you, Daniel, I put off learning about EMF for a while because I I could just tell that this was going to be something that was going to blow my mind in a in a bad way actually Mm -hmm. and so you know when I really dove in to what was happening probably one of the biggest things that struck me in your book was um you know you have this graphic depiction of how much EMF penetrates into an adult versus a six-year-old versus you know I think it's a 10-year-old and that was shocking to Mm -hmm. me Shocking. Yeah. Can you explain um, for us, a, for, for the audience a little bit, um, you know, first of all, what EMF radiation is and, and why it's so important that we think of that in terms of, of the, the penetration to the brain and children? Okay, so um, the wiring in the walls, the 60 hertz power coming from the wires outside your home, they generate electromagnetic radiation. Right. Um, th- they generate extremely low frequency generated s- emissions. W- anytime there's electronics running through and, and there's a demand on the electronics, electromagnetic radiation comes out of the, out of the wall. But it's not too far. And oftentimes we're probably probably okay because, we're not that close to all the sources of that emission. Uh, On the other hand, when you talk about radio frequency, RF, the stuff that comes from your Wi-Fi, the stuff that comes from your laptop, Mm 
the stuff that comes from your cell phone. That's radio frequency signals. And every time you pick up a cell phone and you use it to your head, it can go up to five miles away. That's how much power is being generated. It can go almost five miles out there. When you use your Wi-Fi, you can be up to 500, actually today, over a thousand foot away from the router and it will pick up the signal. So there's a lot of power coming out of this stuff. So over 30 years ago, the FCC said, we wanna make sure that the power coming out of devices don't have a thermal impact to the person using it, particularly towards the head, a thermal impact. In other words, what's a thermal impact? When you have a microwave and you put a piece of meat inside a microwave oven, the heat, the water, be, the water heats up, the cells oscillate and they heat up and they cook your meat. Well, that's a radio frequency signal. They call it a microwave, but they're one and the same. So when I say thermal, I'm talking about heating up stuff. So the FCC decided over 30 years ago that we can't allow the area around the cell phone to heat up more than two degrees. And we wanna make sure the power level that's coming out of that cell phone is not strong enough to enter more than one to two inches into the head. The way they figured it out was they took a bunch of six foot males that were in the army and they said, we want to make sure that those standards sort of relate to the users. And they said, let's model, let's figure out what this, the brain, uh, the, the brain protection that comes from the outer skin, from the cranium. And a, as you know, a six foot male has a cranium that's really thick, <laughs> yeah. hard to get stuff through. And, and then, <laughs> so there's physical resistance that comes from when you use a cell phone and it's preventing your skin, your bone, all of that's preventing the signal from going into your head. So if you're a six foot male, it won't increase on the average two degrees and it won't penetrate one to two inches into the head. Well, Jennifer, that represents about 3% of the population. If you think about it, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, what's interesting is um, for all clinical studies, that's that's what they do. I mean, for every drug study, that's the same thing that they do. They use healthy 20-something males right. to test everything. And, you know, that that's always been one of, one of my issues just with, you know, general drug development. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah, it represents 3% of the population. And, and, you, and you referred to images I had. Um, on in the Radiation Nation book that I, I wrote. And that was intentional. I wanted to show you that he, six foot males are not the ones necessarily using it. And that if you're younger, you won't find the same resistance path in women, children, smaller men. And um, as a result, it goes completely through a six year old child's head. And as we mentioned when we were starting off, uh, for somebody like me, uh, I'm using it for 20 years of my life. For Weston, he'll be using it his entire life. He's going to call his grandmother uh, and he's going to talk to his grandma. And they're not going to talk occasionally, very short intervals. They're going to have conversations that can last minutes to hours sometimes. And so the duration and uses of phones which was based on the standard, was a couple of minutes every so often. And today we have a six-year-old talking to his grandma all half the day on a cell phone with a signal penetrating through. Now, what's interesting about the standard, by the way, it referred to only the heating up of the cell. Um, and it turns out that all modern research says, that's probably one of the last things you've got to be worried about. We worry about more of the biological impacts, not the thermal impacts. And it's typically 
like if you hear of somebody who has um you know a, a foggy thinking in their brain it, that's not thermal it's biological interference so and we're going to talk a little bit about that later but the kinds of stuff we see happening with the devices around our, our bodies today with the cell phone talking to the cell tower with the wi-fi in a connection with the tablet on your lap and uh, with the router in the corner of the room all of these are not just thermal emissions they're biological and a microwave oven technically is a 2.3 gigahertz signal your, your wi-fi is 2.4 gigahertz it's virtually the same frequency of a microwave uh, for all practical purposes and uh, the only difference is the power level of a cell phone is much lower than the power level of a microwave, but it is a microwave signal. Right. You know, Weston um, actually had, uh, you know, a question about the EMF safety standards. Why don't you go ahead, Weston? Okay. So, you know, like the EMF safety standards are like way like um, off from what they should be. Uh, do you like have any like just recommendation or like just a guess of like what the EMF safety standards really like should be more closer to? Uh, that's a very good question, Weston. Um, if you go to Europe, roughly speaking, the power levels of a cell phone are half the power level of the U.S. So the U.S. has a 1.6 watts per kilogram standard, and that's what you're talking about. In, and it's around a certain area. In, in Europe, it's half, basically half the, half the load against the body. So um, I think that's de definitely more like what the standard should look like, uh, and maybe even lower than that. Um, so uh, you want more than uh, dot, dot, dot 75 watts is probably something that is the max, and maybe even less, depending on the transmission and the environment. Okay. So one of the other things that, you know, Weston and I were talking about was you know, when, when we first started learning about this, you know, and I was, I was trying to explain to him the different types of EMF there are. Um, and uh, so I know he has a question to you about that. And I, and I think the audience would appreciate maybe a little more breakdown. Okay. Oh, okay. So EMF radiation is made of, of like electric and magnetic because electromagnetic. And so I've heard that magnetic is like more harmful and that people should not worry about electric that much. Like, I am wondering, is that true? And like, what are your thoughts about it? Like, and, and then, and then how does the RF play into that? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, I don't buy into that because science doesn't understand the difference. Believe it or not, a cell doesn't, can't tell if it's an electrical signal or a magnetic signal. And what we're talking about is the combination of both. So when someone says something's less in electrical versus magnetic, they really haven't looked at science. Science is not clear on any distinction between the two. So anybody who understands the science would never choose to make that choice. Um, but 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 I think you bring up a good question. I'm not sure you were really asking this, but this is a good question because it's a spectrum. When you talk about electromagnetic radiation, it's really a very broad spec uh, spectrum of emissions. Um, like when we talked about in the wall, the, the power coming, the alternating current coming into your house, that's very, very low frequency. It's 60 hertz, 60 cycles per second is what's being transmitted out of the wall. When we talk about um, a cell phone, it's roughly one gigahertz, one billion cycles per second. So for one second, a billion waves go by in one second. Wow. So it's, it's fast. If you talk about like the, the 5G stuff that's coming about, which you may have heard about, Weston, it, it, it's up to 300 gigahertz, 300 billion cycles per second. Wow, that's <sighs> amazing. That's like, and, and, yeah. <laughs> that, go ahead. Like what? Like it's, it's like amazing in a bad way because that could 
probably like real mess you up. <laughs> you know, you know what's, what's interesting about that, Weston, science does not know that for sure. So when you hear someone say it's going to be really dangerous, they haven't looked at science. Um, on the other hand, we know that below 10 gigahertz, we know there are studies, many, 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 a plethora of studies that show potential dangers to the human body. And so those who are in are speculating that it's going to be worse, and, and it may be. Certain studies, which are not statistically significant, it, there's a not enough data that was created in the studies, clearly show serious dangers, but it's not enough of us uh, uh, that data to know. So do you know when you look at uh, the light around the room, that's electromagnetic radiation? Oh, wow. That's visible light is electromagnetic radiation. And, and we'll talk a little bit about this maybe, um, but there is a part of the visible light, the blue component of the light that comes from monitors, that come from uh, your cell phone monitor. And those are pretty dangerous, believe it or not. So if you're looking at a screen all day, you maybe end up having dry eye. You may have prima premature macular degeneration. It's literally very intense, more than the sun is, believe it or not. And that actually can affect you. And it's not the stuff in the walls. It's not the stuff that's coming from your cell phone. It's coming from the devices and the screens you're using. So when you're playing a game, Weston, um, you're actually exposing your eyes to intensities that typically they don't see. And so you gotta be careful about those things too. Um, and then of course, much faster rates are when you go get an X-ray. That's called ionized radiation. The, everything I've talked about is non-ionizing radiation, but X-rays, as you, you may know, wh when you go to the dentist, Weston, and, and they have this big thing they put to your head and they run into the other room and they put a, push a button to take a picture of an X-ray, why are they in the other room and not with you? They're concerned about the exposure of uh, x-rays. So th th there is a more immediate response by the body with x-ray exposures than non-ionized, which is the stuff we're talking about today. But they're equally as concerning with exposures for different reasons. You know, when, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is the fact that, you know, we, we've known about these risks for decades and decades, you know, I mean, we had the, um, the studies in the seventies, you know, that kind of showed us yeah. what was going on with the power lines and the cancer clusters and all that. So, you know, we had so much more information that's been accumulated since then, you know, I mean, I, I mean, you were one of the first people, um, yeah, engineers, you know, working at Bell Labs way back in the day, you know, right. and, and you've seen this progress, you know, like I said, over decades. So why is it that we are ignoring all of this data in these studies? Why do you think that is? I'll make a couple of points. I was in the Bell system and I was analyzing technology in the Bell system. I always worried about how one piece of electronics would interfere with another piece of electronics. As an engineer, engineering group, we weren't concerned about what happens to the human using the technology. It was just like, like we weren't doctors, uh, we were engineers and our job was to make sure everything works. And, and so there's a little bit of that and a, a little bit of a story. You know, when I, when I uh, was probably your age, I used to sneak into my father's bedroom and take a cigarette and smoke it a little bit because I wanted to be a big man course I don't smoke but but I wanted to be a big man do you know over 50 years ago uh, science knew there was a direct link to cancer of lungs from a cigarette yet I thought based on the advertising I saw on tv that uh, I should smoke because I'm going to be a real big man someday and, and so like even though there was all those advertisements science knew that there was a direct link. It took 
more than 50 years before they concluded that smoking a cigarette is bad for your health. And now they're forced uh, to put it on, a, on the packaging. Well, Jennifer, the, 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 the devices around us has really been only the last 10 years or so. We haven't had it around us a really long time. So there's not this huge database of, of, of stuff that we've observed in the marketplace. And um, it, it takes 30 years before those kinds of evidence emerge. And we're sort of in the process of doing that. Uh, however, like cigarette smoking, science is identifying it as a problem. And just that has not influenced mass market. But, uh, and, and so hopefully that helps. Yeah. It's just that, you know, I think scientifically, we, we are more advanced than where we were you know, yes. back, back then. So we should make those associations faster. And it, and it, it just feels like, um, for some reason we're not, um, you know, we know that the human body, you know, is itself is, you know, um, magnetic, you know, I mean, we work right. electrical too. Right? Yeah. We work on, you know, sodium ion channels to right. open the cell membranes and to close them to let certain things in and out, you know? So right. how can, how can we not be affected by outside right. electromagnetic radiation? I mean, cause that's how our body works anyway. So. Yeah. yeah there, there's no question about it. Our science has gone and evolved rapidly along with the technologies that are being deployed. Um, and um, I'm not sure this is something that you thought you'd hear, but the FCC that developed the standard over 30 years ago, over a year or two ago, approved the 5G, the fifth generation technology currently being deployed. And the FCC was brought to court by a group of scientists and they said, you did not look at the data. And believe it or not, the FCC lost in court. They're being forced by the courts to reevaluate the standards to make sure that they're safe for people to use. And that only happened recently. And I think in part is because we, we do have a compelling argument in the science community that d needs to be heard and standards bodies that typically do this kind of thing uh, tend to be slower to respond, and that clashed in the marketplace. You know, his science fair project, he's he's really looking at uh, trying to educate his fellow students right. on mm -hmm. obviously what EMF is, um, you know, how it affects their body, and obviously about you know what can we do about it. So he has a he has a question here for you. Okay. So um. In schools, laptops and like Chromebooks and stuff like that are becoming like increasingly popular. And I need to use my Chromebook for like half of my subjects or more. And so I was just wondering, is there any like ways you can protect yourself from that, even though it's sort of mandatory, mandatory to use those? Or even just, you know, the fact that schools have so much Wi-Fi and EMF in general. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's hard to control that environment because Weston, you are not really deciding what's in that environment. You're sort of being pushed to do what the school system wants you to do. But there are a little bit of things you can do. Like, for example, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but when, when you're very, very, very close to a, a device, that's when it's potentially the most dangerous to the human body. When you have it four foot away, most of those dangers are gone. So the distance that you have between you and the device is um, the more it's away, the better it is. So in other words, if you put it in front of your head and you were reading it and it was six inches between your nose and the screen, that's when it's fairly dangerous. But you take it two foot away, 80% of the danger is gone simply by moving it a little bit away. Um, and um, if you take it and go up to four foot, 98% of the danger is gone. So be aware of the stuff around you. There are other devices in the room, but there's a little bit of a distance and you don't control those devices. But, um, but in general, if you sort of pay attention to what you are doing, uh, you, you help your, your protect yourself. Um, 
The other thing is when you're not using the Chrome, simply turn it off um, or, or put it in airplane mode. Believe it or not, um, that 50% of the time that you're not using it, having that device off is really a good idea because it's not directly influencing your own body. There may be stuff you don't control that your friends may be using it and you, you can't tell them to turn it off. Uh, you, you maybe should suggest they do because <laughs> by turning it off, it actually helps all of the, all the classmates. Well, exactly. And, and I think that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate everybody on, you know, yeah. best practices. Just turn it off and you're really pretty stable. Uh, uh, put it in airplane mode. Um, I, I prefer it off, by the way, because in airplane mode, there's background stuff going on that's transmitting and receiving. So, um, yeah. but, but there are simple things you can do to improve it, not make it best. But, um, you know, as you, you're noting, uh, noting uh, Weston, um, you're going to be using it more and more in your life. It's so integral part of your life. The trick is just to be aware of your environment and ways you can minimize those exposures on things you control. So you're in your book, um, you, uh, you, you do talk about the top three ways to minimize EMF health risks. Right. And, that, and that is number one is create distance. Um, right. And then you also mentioned reduce time. Yes. And then um, the third thing was, you know, and then if at all possible, shield yourself. Yeah. Uh, um, Duration is very important. Uh, if, if you're using a cell phone for an hour during a day or more, that's considered a heavy use. And wow. in, uh, yeah, an hour. Wow. And, and in 10 years, you have statistically three times more likelihood of, of some sort of uh, cancer or other serious event in the in the body. So heavy use is a big deal. If you use it for a couple of minutes, Jennifer, and 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 then you put the phone down, you never have to worry about any concerns about the impact because it really hasn't had enough time to really do some serious influence to the cells themselves. So the other, as you point out, it's uh, um, distance is your friend. The amount of time you use it is your friend. Um, and if uh, both of them are not um, uh, uh, enough and you still want to use the device uh, close by your bed, th there are ways of minimizing your exposures through shielding technologies that are exist in the marketplace. Okay. Uh, you know, you touched on the fact that, you know, turning off devices is a lot better than just having them in airplane mode. In, yes. Um, in your book, you described you're actually being subjected to three different types of radiation from your cell phone. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's the other part about this world we're now in um, is that more and more stuff that we buy has all these transmitters in them. Uh, your cell phone, you have actually four different transmitters. You have your cell tower connection. You can transmit Wi-Fi and you can transmit Bluetooth. And then there's background stuff going on for uh, GPS and stuff like that. And so like, I always encourage people who are trying to be aware of their environment there are other actions you can do. You can reduce the number of transmitters in your environment. So when I have a cell phone, I always keep it far away from me, actually I have different parts of the house. Uh, but um, when I have it close to me, I don't have my Bluetooth on. I don't have my Wi-Fi on. Uh, I turn them off. In general, you wanna think about it as, well, I think about each, transmitter being like a bee in the room. Uh, one bee stinging you won't hurt you in general, mm -hmm. unless you're allergic, but a thousand will. So you're trying to turn all those bees off when you're not using it. You're, you're trying to take your connection to the Wi-Fi to your, your laptop as being an ethernet connection, a, a wire versus a Wi-Fi signal. 
Uh, so anytime you can turn them off in the device or make them hardwired, which is, by the way, what you should convince the kids in school to do, um, that's hard to do. But um, you're reducing the number of bees. You're reducing the level of exposure. So they're real things you can actually do. And um, another way, you know, I, I mentioned turning it off. Like I have a router uh, in the very, very far, very far corner of my house, not where there's any living. And um, at night, I have a $10 timer that turns it off. It just turns it off. And then it, when I wake up at five o'clock in the morning, it turns it back on because I may want to use it. So I'm, re, I'm managing the area I'm in by turning stuff off or, uh, or, um, uh, or wiring it. And that makes it more safe. Yeah. So, I mean, after reading your book and, um, you know, just doing our own investigations, actually, uh, just, I think it was like, Four days ago, my husband um, rejiggered everything in our house so that, uh, you know, the Wi-Fi router is not anywhere near right. any of us sleeps. And then um, we hardwired about half of the devices. So we still have about half to go. That, that's um, wonderful. That's actually wonderful. But, you know, it's so funny is um, uh, we lived in this house for about a little over 20 years. And about 10 years ago, we added um, an addition onto the house. And at that point in time, um, my husband had hardwired Ethernet cables into every oh. room. And, you know, we were, we were joking about three years later because by – by that time, everything was wireless. And we mm -hmm. were like, oh man, we did all that hardwiring for nothing. And now we're like, oh my God, I'm so glad we hired <laughs> Right, exactly. Like, like, you know, it's so crazy to think that, you know, we think we're advancing technology, but we end up going back a little bit now because of the safety concerns, because we're realizing now, like, you know, it's, we had no idea right. uh, what we were getting into with making everything Bluetooth, everything wireless. So, yeah. um, so we're definitely doing that now. And and you have probably like when you have uh, these little boxes by your TV mm -hmm. that th that you watch Netflix on and all those kinds of applications. Yes. And then you run an Ethernet. It's much better. It than running Wi-Fi is yeah, faster, yeah, right? I know, it's right? better service. <laughs> it's like you kind of forgot, you know, that it it is faster and it is more reliable, and and so you're actually we're actually getting you know a little speed upgrade at the same right. time. Right there, you go. <laughs> yeah, that, that's um, that's so funny. Um, so the third thing that you mentioned was shielding, and yep. um, so you know, since that's one of the well, that is you know one of the major focus. Um, of Wesson's science fair project, um, you know, he wants to ask you another question about that. Okay. So, um, uh, you like you have recently developed a technology that kind of it, it blocks like a lot of like the the highest highest levels of five G frequencies and. It's it's like the one of the most powerful shieldings created. Um, can you like tell um, the audience about how that was developed and made? Yes, um, I will. Um, when we when we started off, um, I combined many technologies into one device to make sure I provided protection. Um, and uh, I actually worked with foundries to develop stuff sort of like the way I wanted it. And I was able to um, shield any technology that was around at that time. And, and it went for years that we had the right technology to do that. Um, and now that you know what a gigahertz is, I went up to, typically nothing above 10 gigahertz, uh, but I always doubled to ensure that I tested at 20 gigahertz just to make sure that over time it protects. But then came five, fifth, fifth generation. Fifth generation is fundamentally different in, um, in some ways 
and very common in other ways to the earlier technologies. Uh, all the stuff you hear about today is, is really like 4G, believe it or not. It's the same that's come out of your cell phone today. It's the same you're going to use in 5G. Most services are like that. But they're going up to 300 gigahertz. And that's where there was no technology to shield. And um, in, in my past background, I had actually worked with some of the military on developing kinds of ways of shielding things. And I began working with a group a couple of years ago. And I said, we have to change the technologies of shielding for the technologies uh, that are being deployed. So we continue helping people uh, find ways of shielding themselves uh, in these new technologies. So um, although I was in Bell Labs, in an electrical engineering role, I'm actually a mechanical engineer. So I have metallurgy background, I have experience in that kind of space. And I began working with the right combination of alloys to improve the technologies that were out there today to up to, um, actually now we, we actually shield up to 90 gigahertz. It's so, it's like nothing exists in the marketplace that actually can shield those technologies. Yet, that technology is really in its infant stage of deployment in small cell sites in front of your house. Literally, not, maybe not your house, but it is being deployed at 23 and 60 gigahertz, uh, providing very, very high bandwidth to your house at very, very high rates. And so, it was, believe it or not, uh, iteration of iteration of iteration of performance. And believe it or not, we couldn't even test it because I couldn't find antennas that could generate precise signals. So we could actually measure it with precise equipment. So we had to find new ways of uh, transmitting uh, uh, frequency rates that had to be shielded with precise transmission so we could have a precise measurement of performance. And that iteration uh, with, with, uh, with that partner enabled us to break through up to 90 gigahertz. And now we're working on up to 600 gigahertz because the next generation 6G is up to 600 gigahertz. Wow, you know, you would think that uh, your local municipalities would be required to tell you the type of radiation levels that you're being subjected to. Um, you're, you're right, you would, you would think that. And, and in fact, in the past, that was always true. I was the chair of uh, the planning and zoning board of my local town, and no cell tower could ever go up without me approving it, as is the case with all municipalities in the US. Um, in the past, uh, it would require approvals by the local mu municipalities. But with 5G, the FCC created basically federal law that said you cannot interfere with, um, uh, in, uh, with a, a deployment of fifth generation technologies. So they have prevented the municipalities from doing historically what they did to prevent possible concerns right. with technology. Yeah. It really said. It is, it is. So it sounds to me like it's really going to be up to people, everybody, anybody listening to podcasts like this, um, to take it upon themselves to start educating their townships um, on, yeah. on the reality of, of what is being rolled out if, no, if the municipality really isn't going to touch it anymore. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, that, that is what's going on. And, and fortunately, um, the, the recent FCC loss in court will help fix that. But be honest with you, Jennifer, um, we're going to be old before this is all over. So you really got to get smart about what you want to do in your environment. Yeah, you know, and it, I agree. And, um, you know, kind of uh, circling 
Back to the Defender Shield technology um, that you were just describing to us, uh, you know, that's obviously going to be a big part of Weston Science Fair project. Um, uh, Weston, why don't you um, sh hold up uh, some of the things that, uh, that, that we plan on testing. Obviously, um, we are testing out uh, many of your products. So, you know, the first uh, we have, obviously, your um, iPad, um, tablet, um, but we also have your initial laptop um, pad as well, yes. which is which is off camera. Right over but, there. Um, was that the first thing that you created um, when you started Defender Shield? Was that? It, it was uh, Jennifer. A little over twelve years ago, um, my adult men sons were visiting, and they had their laptops in their lap. And my wife turned around and she's a social worker. She said, that technology on the lap can't be good for you. I want grandchildren to get it off your lap. And I said, no, that's, that's crazy. I'm, I'm very familiar with the technologies being deployed there. And I simply don't believe that the power level is enough to hurt you. And I'm familiar with what all that stuff is, right? So, right. but then I said to myself, wait a minute, uh, let me, let me look into that a little bit. And I, I was amazed about how much data had been around since the 70s, as you said, actually, it's truer than that. Mm -hmm. And that said, this can be potentially harmful. And it does influence the male and the female uh, in negative ways. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was the start of the journey. And I created the Defender Pit which was our first product for my sons. I, I figured we're not victims. There are things we can do. Let's create something to help you. Right. And that's literally how I created the Defender Pad. And at that time, I had three different layers of materials to prevent all known transmission from a laptop from passing through. And that's how I started. Um, and fast forward, to, and I in, integrated those into all of our other technologies that we deploy, like the tablet and um, um, cases, all the things we have. Um, and then um, I, I was able to introduce the fifth generation shielding. I'm actually now providing shielding in all my products uh, that, that I know can become a source of these transmitting. And I've been able to reduce it to two shielding materials. One is for the radio frequency signals. And believe it or not, it's fundamentally different when you're trying to shield extremely low frequency, anything under 300 Hertz, okay. it's different technology. So we actually have two shielding. Um, and um, it now, it doesn't take me three, I can do it in two. And believe it or not, Weston, I actually have under development, a technology that's one sheet of material that does extremely low frequency up to 90 gigahertz. So I'm trying to improve the technologies we have by continuing adding different elements to the design to continue improving the efficacy of the shielding. That's amazing. <laughs> like just even three layers just to protect you, that's still pretty good. And then two, and then now you're trying to develop uh, one with one, that's just, really amazing and cool, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, I do. I think it's cool too, young fella. <laughs> yeah. So can you talk about, um, you know, how the technology works when we're talking about things like Whoa. your um, your eye shield, you know, hat, and I'm especially interested in um, having you explain why it's so important um, when we're talking about ear protection as well. So, um, there, we started with, electronics and building packaging around their electronics to minimize it. But one of the things that always concerned me was the ambient in the room. I didn't talk about this, but uh, when, when you're in a classroom, a cell phone is 1.6 watts, remember 1.6 watts. Your classroom on the average is likely dot five watts. It's about a third the power level, constantly over eight hours. So I'm very worried about that exposure. That's not even coming from your cell phone or your laptop, 
but it's in the air because there's so many things producing it. And that's really what prompted me to look for ways of protecting the body against those ambients we were being exposed to. So we have a cap. Why a cap? Well, because the brain's influenced from the power levels that are now. And I'm not sure you're electric hypersensitive, but over 20% over of the population gets headaches. They get uh, uh, physiological um, uh, changes, sleep disturbance, um, um, burning sensation, foggy thinking. All of those things are potentially influenced by the cell phone, but also the ambient. And, and the uh, eye mask, for example. Do you know, um, we talked about the eye and it being dry and, and it's, um, and the back of the eye, premature macular degeneration, but it's also, believe it or not, influenced by the blue light. When, when you're, if you're looking at your monitor when you're, when you're about ready to go to bed at night for let's say a couple of hours, there's a tiny little protein switch in the back of your eye, which is a cryptochrome protein that turns the melatonin on and off. Melatonin is used to help you sleep. And if that switch doesn't turn on and you put the laptop down, you're not going to go to sleep because the process of melatonin that's important to go into your cycle of sleep and repair and all the other things that happen. Um, is not triggered. So another thing, duration, make sure you put your laptop or a tablet or whatever you're using before you go to bed, at least one to two hours before you actually go to sleep. Um, so um, those kinds of influences are through the eye. And the ambient in our environment is growing. And that's why we created the eye mask. There's actually shielding inside the eye mask that prevents any of the ambient in the room from going through the eye or through the side. And that's actually to help reduce those exposures, particularly for the electric hypersensitive. So um, uh, electromagnetic radiation finds its least resistive path literally to the brain through the eye. And that's why we created those kinds of devices. Now with, with the Earbuds, which I'm using, by the way, um, uh, uh, is uh, the most concern you have is when you have a laptop to your head. If you have it two, two foot or more away and you're talking uh, uh, on speakerphone, you're, you're pretty safe. 80% of the danger is gone. Um, if you're uncomfortable doing that, because everyone's going to hear what you're saying, Weston. So your mom's going to get mad at you. You say something wrong. Um, you put it, uh, uh, earbuds on, and you plug them into the cell phone, and you can use that to talk and communicate. But that's actually there's an electrical signal coming up the wire. So our goal was to eliminate all the environmental uh, uh, toxins coming from the the wire is itself. And what we do is we, we take a wire from your laptop or your cell phone and we convert it using a speaker, a tiny little speaker midway up the wire. And what it does is it's a speaker and it makes all the sound. So we created an acoustical link between the speaker and the ear air piece itself and we have eliminated electrical um current yeah dri driving through that part and the head is um yeah and and the head is where it, you have to worry most uh, because it's the sense most sensitive parts of the body uh, amongst other areas so this is all hollow hollow yeah that's all it is okay. it's an acoustical link okay well that's a that's really amazing technology. Um, now I know you've you guys have also created um, a similar device to you know these yeah. larger, larger headphones as well. Yeah, let me tell you why I did that. Um, 
interesting story. I was at a conference and a mother, an activist mother who had an autistic child mm -hmm. wanted her child to listen to music and he doesn't like stuff in his ears. So we created an acoustical link to overhead ears. And so now kids, uh, and particularly the, uh, the sensitive uh, autistic child can use and listen to music without any exposures. Um, and then once we had been able to do that engineering to make it work and be successful, we did it for an adult set as well. But it was motivated from the, uh, a mother who, who wanted her child to listen to music. It's a great story. I love yeah. it. Yeah, it, it took it took me two years, by the way. <laughs> wow! Wow! All right. Uh, so you know, you mentioned um, basically EMF hypersensitivity, and yeah. you, you know, one of the major um, symptoms of that, you know, are headaches. Yeah. And you know, I just wonder. You know, when you have kids in school who suffer from headaches, you know, if that's potentially part of, you know, part of the problem, um, you know, and it, it just makes me think about how the fact that kids are so, well, adults are so quick to medicate kids for different things these days, right. rather than taking a look at what's in the environment that could potentially cause, be causing the headaches. Um, but could you talk a little bit about EMF hypersensitivity? Uh, I, I will. I, I, let me give you an example. I work with clinics often. And I was talking with the head physician at the, and he was telling me how one of the people he works with is one of his uh, teammates had dry eye. And I asked him, well, what do you do about it? Uh, he said, well, we have drops in the last five years, we've been giving drops to the, to this person. And I said, why do you think, uh, what do you think the cause is? And he said, well, we're not really sure. Well, I said, have you thought about the blue coming off the monitor that they're looking at every day? And he said, well, no, we really haven't thought about that. So I actually have also uh, blue blocking um, devices, which I sent them on. Within two hours, her dry went to wet and never had a problem again. Wow. And so you're right. There is very much misdiagnosis because, you know, you go to the doctor, 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 I have a headache. No, I'll take two aspirin and come back to me tomorrow. It's the router next to the person, not, not because she's got chronic headaches. And there's clear evidence of that um, through many studies, but it's not enough studies to make it a, a, a statistically high level of confidence conclusion. Um, but let's talk about electrohypersensitivity. Um, Electrohypersensitivity is, is the body response to, uh, to it. It's almost a canary in the coal mine. Um, it's roughly, 20, depending on what studies you look at, it's roughly 20% and it's growing. And Jennifer, of that, 80% of women. It, it affects women more than men, girls more than boys. We don't have any idea why that's true. They, there's been discussion about hormone, brain differences. There's, there's a lot of discussions of why that's true. Occupational exposures, uh, no one really knows, but that seems to be growing. And the conditions that you may have can be as simple as a headache. But we've actually, uh, there, there is a clinic we work with is, that only deals with like hypersensitivity, Dr. Dr. EMF. And he, uh, he actually had a patient walk in on a wheelchair because of his exposures. That's how debilitating it was for him. And they, they found through some of the work they did that it was in fact because of the occupational work he was doing and needed to minimize exposures. As they began weaning off those exposures, his body health began improving. So they're, they're at least in those kinds of studies, there's been clear evidence of improvement based on exposures that literally do change the way the body responds. 
I haven't talked about this, and this is something that um, maybe is um, relatively new. You've, you've probably heard of oxidative stress, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, oxidative stress. I hate oxidative stress as a reference to what the body does. That, that, that's an imbalance of uh, radicals to antioxidants, right? And so right. it really doesn't tell you exactly what's going on in the body. Uh, although no, they, yeah, I yeah, try they, to explain to people yeah. the chemical reaction that's occurring, you know, and the fact that you know a lot of it is normal, but we're at we're adding to it to levels that the body can't handle. Right. Actually, to re, I'm going to depart just a little bit to reinforce that. If you're in a classroom and you have in one corner a gasoline, 55 gallon drum of gasoline. And it, the, the, the volatile organic compounds, the gases coming out of that are going into the classroom. And on the other side, uh, left-hand side of the front room, you have a welder sitting there welding uh, the steel in the classroom. And then you have a Wi-Fi in the back. If you are the World Health Organization, do you differentiate any of them at all from the other? The answer is no, they're two be carcinogenics. So you're right, it's like this stuff is a toxin as with any other toxin and it's influencing our body. And um, you need to be aware of those influences because they truly do change the body response. Now I'm gonna go back a little bit about, I, I hate antioxidant, uh, I mean, uh, oxidative stress because I don't think it describes anything. But you would actually be interested, Jennifer, in Dr. Navio's work. Dr. Navio's work talks about cell danger response. And what he talks about is the environment, the toxins in our environment are, are affecting the cells of our body. Uh, it's a fight or flight response. And when it's in a fight response, the cells are not doing what they typically do, sharing proteins and all kinds of stuff you expect them to do. And as a result of that, there are, there, there are conditions that generate within the body that can become chronic. And, and so the, for the first time, I have a better understanding through CDR and Dr. Navio's work, because it really does begin describing how they relate to exposures and the cyclic um, body function and how that improves with good sleep and good practice of eating, all that kind of stuff. So. Um, you may want to look into that work. He's out of California, California, San Diego. He yeah. does wonderful work. I, I definitely will. And, you know, just circling back to what you said about how women seem to be more affected. You know, I, it's, it's interesting because women typically tend to have more things like migraine headaches. They're typically more, uh, more affected by environmental toxins in general. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and so I believe there is a hormonal component to that, but I think yes. it also has to do with um, neurochemistry. Yep. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, you know, one of the things that I talk about on my podcast all the time called autobiology, because I want people to truly understand their own biology, not just right. human biology, but their own very specific yep. biology. Yep. Um, and there are very specific tests that you can do now that look very specifically at your neurobiology. Um, most recent one I just did was through the DNA company and they can show you how well or not you eliminate toxins from your body. And so if you're already impaired, which a lot of women are through, through sheer hormonal chemistry, then I think that that translates into the fact that you're not going to be able to handle the toxicity load from EMF in addition to all the other environmental toxins. That's absolutely a fact. In fact, we've done some work in which we've identified specific mutated genes that actually gives you pre, um, your you're more susceptible to the exposure than a normal person is with that. In fact, uh, Yale a couple of years ago did a study in which they looked at the pineal gland. And, and what they found was that if you had fluoride, you had Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz, and um, you had uh, a mutated cell, 
you were three times more likely to have cancer of the thyroid. Wow. That's what, yeah, so you're absolutely right. There's predisposition, and I think that's in part. But the other thing beyond hormones, which I actually believe you're right, by the way, it's also there are chemicals you ingest through the medications you take that have carrier metals and things like that that begin um, imbalance, creating imbalances in your body and high levels of uh, minerals, um, metals, um, or, or for that matter, any other uh, toxin can, um, can also have a predisposition. So um, this has been a debate, um, but, it, but this is a fact. And, and by the way, Jennifer, if you're electric hypersensitive, you're probably multiply chemically sensitive. So the way- Yeah, they've definitely shown that to be- Yeah, yeah. right. I, I always know when someone's electrically hypersensitive, when I ask them, what, what kind of perfume you use? I say, oh, I don't use perfume. Um, I'm going to depart. There's something I want to talk to Weston about. Absolutely. Um, kid, kids use these earbuds that are wireless. Um, and so what they do is they use Bluetooth from the cell phone that connects to wirelessly to the, to the earpieces. And often many of these take and communicate from one ear to the other ear using Bluetooth to get through. All right. You remember a cell phone is 1.6 watts. Yeah. You remember Bluetooth is dot three watts, right? Mm -hmm. yep. It's five times less power than a cell phone. Dot one watt, dot one watt can influence a frontal lobe cell. So you have a Bluetooth transmitting through the head at dot three watts. And we know from science, a third of that power level is required to mutate a cell. So don't if you can use earbuds that are wireless for those reasons. Yeah, that is very surprising. Like, I can't believe they would even like allow that to happen, you know? Yeah, but, but they do. It's really, it's unbelievable. And, and, and honestly, I was an engineer that built stuff that maybe is harmful because I was an engineer, not on a medical community expert. And so if this, if there's a moral to the story, it's like, you better make sure you protect yourself the way you want to control your environment and not let others do that for you. Yeah, I think that's very important too. <laughs> like just do whatever you need to do. Yeah, exactly. And you're, and you're making the choices, right? It, you're, you're looking at the information and you're deciding what you want to do with what you know and where you're willing to risk and where you're not are answered here and i'm very thankful that we got to do this because yeah. this is very informative and i enjoyed it a lot oh cool I'm, I'm glad you did um i enjoyed it as well i oftentimes don't have someone who really knows what they're talking about on, on a podcast you know what i mean yeah <laughs> <laughs> well you know and i think that that's um you know, that's kind of expected, right? Because really people are just starting to wake up to this. And yeah. you know, I, uh, you know, I know we're grateful for people like you to give us that information. Um, but, but, you know, there are some of us, I, I think, who have decided to take on the educational aspect, you know, yeah. of um, not only EMFs, but just in general, some of the environmental toxins uh, that, you know, are compounded by yeah. EMF yeah. radiation. I think that are going to be more talked about, um, moving forward, you know, in the, in the community and the world now is, I think, you know, maybe just a little more woken up to the fact that they need to take care of their health a little more. Um, yeah, I agree, so, Jennifer. Yeah. It, it really is true. It's more complicated than ever before and moving at a blistering pace like ever before. So you really do need to be aware of your environment. All those toxins influence a cell and sometimes for good, but also sometimes not so good. So I think education is really pretty important. It's, by the way, Jennifer, it's unusual for me to talk about product. I don't like doing it. Our role 
and your role are to help people understand what the facts are. Yeah. And that's what we're here for to do. Yeah. It, but, you know, the reality is, is that, um, and, and you talk about this in your book, and I do, if, if, if you haven't read Radiation Nation, I highly recommend that you do. But, you know, you talk about the fact that, um, you know, people love technology. You know, I love tech, you love tech. I mean, you've been in tech for, you know, your whole life. And it's not that we need to do away with it, but we need to right. learn how to live with it safely. Yes. And that, that, you know, and that's the whole reason that you started Defender Shield. Yeah. Um, and that's the reason why we, we need people like you to make products, um, you know, to help us make that transition. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that was our goal, in fact. B believe it or not, it was out of frustration. The more I got involved, the more I realized that science knows a lot. Research knows a lot. Yet the average person knew nothing, including me, who was in the business. So um, we just had to close that gap a little bit and giving people sort of a pointer on where to look is, is helpful for, the, for them and, and their families. So that's our job. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Daniel, for coming on uh, the podcast today and, and helping Weston uh, get some great information for his science fair project as well. Well, thank you for inviting me, Jennifer and Weston. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed the conversation and you have a good day. All right. Thanks. You too, Daniel. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.